Okay, I might mention that the, the title was suggested to me by the conference organizers. I hope the uh, talk lives up to the title, but uh, I also say if you don't find the talk uh, particularly uplifting, uh, then you want to blame uh, the organizers and not me. We're talking about a meltdown here. <laughs> uh, but I talk about these same sorts of things uh, in class. Uh, and in fact, uh, I tell my class that if they sign up for my course in macroeconomics, they'll get a balanced view. Uh, that is one view from me and another view on the network news when they hear from the administration officials. <laughs> okay? uh, things aren't quite as rosy as uh, the officials would allow you, uh, lead you to believe. Uh, the anatomy of a market breakdown. I do teach macroeconomics, so I'm inclined to think in terms of fiscal policy and monetary policy. In fact, what most of us see brewing right now uh, is a collision course uh, that is going to have uh, the monetary authority uh, at odds uh, with the fiscal authority. And uh, it all hinges on such things as uh, the national uh, debt and uh, the annual deficits, uh, the trends in saving uh, these days, and uh, the Fed's uh, ability to control credit markets and uh, monetary aggregates. So those are the kinds of things I'll be focusing on. And where better to start than what's been in the news lately, uh, which uh, is the federal budget deficits. Uh, so on my first slide here, I've pulled up a number of, of charts, uh, this being the first one that will uh, clue you in about what's going on and put in perspective what you've been uh, seeing on the news. The yellow line is the zero line. That's a balanced budget. Uh, you can see that we uh, had a surplus during the uh, boom years uh, of the Clinton administration, uh, a deficit to follow. And uh, uh, this chart comes from uh, the St. Louis Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve Economic Data, affectionately known as FRED. Uh, I've got it linked to my uh, own website where you can click in and uh, see what's going on uh, graphically and otherwise. Um, this chart uh, shows the deficit as of the end of this uh, previous fiscal year, which ended uh, uh, the first day of this month. And it, uh, it's got an overestimate. It shows it just over $400 billion in the red. And if you've listened to news accounts lately, it came in a little less than that, uh, something that the administration ballyhooed quite uh, <laughs> joyously. It came in at uh, $374 billion. And in, in a way, I wish it had come in just a little less. I, I would have liked to have seen uh, the, the figure 365 billion because that might have reminded a few people that that translates into a billion dollars a day. <laughs> okay, that's the rate at which the government's borrowing. Uh, and in fact, uh, these days, uh, it's been borrowing at a clip of about a billion and a half a day. Now, uh, projections for the next fiscal year uh, or are for $500 billion or more, and that's from the administration officials. And so my sus suspicion is it will be more and possibly uh, quite a lit little bit more. Uh, we can add that onto our graph. Uh, expected to go down to about $500 billion, something like that. And if it goes to 525, that's sort of another interesting figure because that one translates into a million dollars a minute. All right, mm -hmm. would you... Again, borrowing uh, at a pretty good clip. Uh, it's not even tapering off if you adjust for the 374 this time. It's pretty much a straight line uh, headed down. Let's take a close-up at, at this, uh, or rather uh, take a long shot at, at, at this same uh, graph and put in perspective uh, the previous depths of debt uh, and the current depths. Because you hear it uh, debated on the news whether or not the current level of indebtedness or the current uh, rate of borrowing, the deficits, is uh, worse than uh, the deficits that were run under the first Bush uh, administration. Um, so we're entitled to ask, uh, will the Bush 43 deficit of 2004, that w what we're going to take to be about 500, and that's a charitable figure, is it worse than the Bush 41 deficit of uh, 1992? Uh, once again, let me get those deficits down there where they need to be, okay? Something like that, and then around $500 billion. Uh, and if you look at, uh, at the point uh, I've shown there, that's the 500. Uh, and uh, in 1992, deficits were uh, as great as $293 billion. Well, uh, you can look at it and see which one's worse in nominal terms. 
But the administration is, is right there to put a smiley face on it, put a happy face on it. And, of course, the first thing they do is divide it by gross domestic product uh, and show you that uh, it's not so bad now, uh, given that uh, GDP is actually higher and substantially higher than it was in 1992. First thing I want to do is warn you against that particular reckoning of the deficit. Uh, if you remember your macro from uh, college years, you know that GDP uh, measures essentially everything. It's all spending on consumer goods, net investment, government spending. It's the whole shooting match. It measures everything. And it's almost trivially true that anything is fairly small compared to everything. Okay? <laughs> it just works that way. It works that way. Okay? And so I show that to you in numbers for those of you who are numbers prone. Compare deficit to GDP. 1992 is 4.7%. Okay? And uh, 2004, uh, with, uh, and I'm allowing for a little growth next year, probably a little more than we'll actually have, 4.5%. So on that basis, we're actually, looks like three tenths uh, of a percent better they were, than we were in 92. Now, I would suggest that that's the wrong measure, that even if you do want to normalize with respect to some other uh, uh, macro number, the right number to, to normalize with respect to would not be everything. It would be saving. In other words, if the government's going to borrow, it has to borrow what somebody has saved. Uh, and so we have to look at trends in saving. I'll pull some up later. But for right now, we can just compute the figures. And what you'll notice is that the saving uh, has well, actually been going down in the last two or three years in absolute terms. And it certainly hasn't been going up, generally, as fast as income, okay, partly because of administration policies and Federal Reserve policies. So let's look at uh, saving. So compare deficit to saving. This is my ratio, and I'm amazed at how little this ratio ever gets used. Keep your eye out and keep your, you know, watch all the reports and see if anyone ever reports a deficit to saving. So in other words, that's how much borrowing the government is doing relative to how much there is to be borrowed. I mean, that's got to be uh, the relevant criteria. And in 1992, uh, the government was borrowing uh, the equivalent of about 28, well, 0.8 percent of uh, total gross savings, that's private and corporate savings, uh, in this country. Uh, now is up to 35.7, so well over a third of the total savings, right? Uh, and, and I argue that's a large number and it's, it's, it's a substantial increase. I'll show you later why this is a particularly relevant number and in what sense we consider 35.7 percent to be large, although it may occur to you as obvious that that's a fairly large figure. Um, I might mention at this point uh, that there's been an interesting turnaround in the apologetics about the uh, government borrowing. Uh, if you remember back in the old days, uh, the heyday of Keynesianism, uh, the popular bromide uh, to, to dismiss any worries about deficits is that we owe it to ourselves, okay? You've heard that we owe it to ourselves. That was the old Keynesian bromide popularized by Abba, Abba Lerner. And it strikes me as odd that the current bromide is precisely the opposite of that, but supposedly equally effective rhetorically, I guess. And the way it's uh, typically stated is that, oh, uh, we have access to world capital markets. Uh, now, what that translates into is we don't owe it to ourselves, okay? <laughs> so watch, uh, and it's not too unusual to find both claims in the same article, okay? Don't worry about the deficit because, A, we owe it to ourselves, and, B, we don't owe it to ourselves. We're borrowing <laughs> world capital markets, okay? So we need to get it straight. Which is it? And it turns out, of course, neither, neither uh, is an excuse for running uh, astronomically high deficits. Now, it's true, uh, as some, someone might point out, that the federal government isn't literally borrowing 35.7% of your savings, of domestic saving. In fact, if they were, if, if the only access to saving they had was the saving that's done in this country, uh, then interest rates would be sky high rather than in the basement. Uh, in fact, most of the borrowing these days is done abroad, our foreign trading partners. Uh, are the ones that are holding the debt, and, and foreign central banks are holding uh, the U.S. debt. Uh, 
Okay, but that creates a problem in its own right uh, because there's no uh, there's no reason that we should count on them continuing to be willing to lend our government that much money. Okay, and should they should they stop? Should they decide it's a bad deal? Uh, then uh, we would get the problems in, in, in a more dramatic way and in a more uh, at home way with uh, with high interest rates. We'll see more about that uh, later as well. Uh, okay, well, that having been said, maybe I've convinced you that uh, deficit problem now, at least in comparison to savings, actually worse uh, than before. But you might ask, well, uh, why can't we just do the same thing we did before? It looks like we got out of it before. In other words, look at your 1992 point. Uh, can't we just do in 2003 what we did in 1992? Okay, and, and and you can see it on the graph. In uh, 2002, we came out uh, of, of that borrowing binge, right? And uh, so we could ask, well, can't we do the same thing then uh, in 2003? And uh, I'll show you why we can't. Okay, first let me remind you of what happened uh, in 2000 or in 1992. Uh, the uh, upturn started actually before uh, the Bush 41 presidency ended. And it started with uh, Bush's uh, taking on of Jim Baker as his uh, campaign advisor to think of something quick so that they didn't lose the election to that guy from Arkansas. Uh, and what Jim Baker could think of, of course, was a monetary stimulant. And so the Federal Reserve uh, began stimulating the economy uh, in light, late 1992, too close to the election, uh, to have any effect before the election. In other words, too close to save George Bush from defeat. But it started then, and, and eventually it uh, created uh, an economic boom. Uh, Clinton kept the boom going and stepped it up uh, going into 1996 uh, in order to uh, facilitate his uh, re-election. And so we had a, a tremendous uh, boom of the sort that uh, Sean Corrigan was telling you about uh, in last uh, lecture. Now, the way it was triggered, of course, was by lowering the interest rates, dropping interest rates, getting interest rates low to stimulate investment and uh, create the boom. Now, that can't happen now simply because interest rates are already in the basement. They're already too low. Okay, They're out of slack. Or as the way the uh, press likes to couch it, and I'm sort of amused by this because you hear this metaphor, uh, that uh, Greenspan doesn't have many arrows left in his quiver. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's the way it, uh, it gets stated. Well, let's take a closer look at that and see, and see what we can make of it. Um, here, what I've plotted for you, again, I'm getting this uh, straight out of the St. Louis uh, Fed uh, database, is the federal funds rate. That's, that's the interest rate at which banks swap reserves back and forth among themselves at the end of each business day. And uh, the Fed is in there manipulating that rate by sweetening the pie. It will add to the reserves if it wants the rate lower or subtract from the reserves if it wants the rate higher. Well, you can see if you look in 1992, I'll flag it for you right there, that the interest, the federal funds rate was about 4% uh, in, in uh, early 1992. You can see in late 92 and throughout uh, 93, uh, the interest rate was held down to around uh, 3% give or take a little, uh, and that's what got the boom started, okay? Uh, but if you look at the situation now, we got a 1% uh, federal funds rate, uh, and so that's the idea that there's not much room left. And I'll, I'll take for you this uh, small portion over here and just, uh, yeah, okay, how many arrows are left in Greenspan's quiver? That's, that's the burning question you want to take home with you, I guess. Uh, that's just a blow up of the last 10 years of that same uh, graphic. Uh, and here we can see that 1% rate, okay? Uh, and realize, though, that uh, the way the Fed is set up, or at least the way it has been set up for uh, decades, is that there's two rates uh, that allow banks to borrow to meet their reserve requirement. One is this federal funds market, that's the 1%. The target rate, that's the rate you always hear on the network news when Dan Rather or whoever announces the Fed lowered interest rates today. They set their target at 1% or whatever. This has been maintained, uh, this 1% has been maintained since about mid-year uh, in, in 2003. 
But it's also possible for banks to borrow directly from the Fed as opposed to borrowing from other banks. It can borrow directly from the Fed. If it borrows directly from the Fed, it borrows at what's called a discount rate. And the discount rate is, I call it an administered rate, which is to say it simply is what the Fed says it is. Uh, and, and the Fed has traditionally held that rate uh, below the federal funds rate. Well, how far below can you go uh, when the uh, federal funds rate is 1%? Well, let's take a look. Okay, here's the discount rate. And in late 2003, uh, it was set at three quarters of 1%, uh, which is a, a low of lows, okay? It would be a fraction of a percent. In fact, this is one of the reasons, this is one of the things that uh, critics of the Fed would point to to suggest it doesn't have many arrows left in its quiver. It's just trying to lower the federal funds rate, and yet it has to keep that discount rate somewhere below uh, the federal funds rate, and here at 0.75 percent. Well, one thing you'll notice about this chart uh, is that it looks like it stops. In fact, it does stop just short of 2003, but we're well beyond the beginning of 2003. And so it turns out that it's, it's almost uh, under the radar screen. It just didn't get much reporting on the news. But that whole policy was discontinued. The time series is discontinued. The discount policy as we knew it was discontinued at the end of last year. And what was instituted instead uh, was uh, a system of primary and secondary credits, depending on what kind of shape the bank is in. Uh, and what was called the discount rate is now called the primary credit rate. Uh, unless the, and if the bank's in trouble, it borrows at some secondary credit rate, which is a little bit higher. But let me show you how that uh, works. The, the um, primary credit rate was set at the very beginning of this calendar year at 2.25%. Okay, so up here, in fact, I'll stick it on there like so. So you can see all of a sudden in just, in just one policy move on the part of the Federal Reserve, it increased that uh, used-to-be discount rate uh, by that much uh, and then dropped it even later in the year to 2.0%, and that's where uh, it stands right now. So now if you, if you tap into the Federal Reserve uh, website each time that the Federal Open Market Committee meets, instead of uh, hearing or instead of reading an announcement about the Fed funds rate and the lower discount rate, you hear an announcement about the federal funds rate and the now higher uh, primary credit rate. Uh, now, why do they do this? Uh, I suggest that the reason is is to give them more room, to give them some slack between where they are, namely 1%, and zero, okay, to get that uh, primary rate above uh, the federal funds rate. Uh, I've plotted, in fact, I pulled this off of uh, the St. Louis Fed site, and it's a new series because we just started at the beginning this year, so it shows that uh, primary credit rate uh, at 2.5 percent or 2.25 percent, and then dropping to 2 percent uh, in middle of June, uh, where it remains. Okay, so I think I've summarized down here: the Fed now has a primary credit rate above the Fed funds rate, instead of a discount rate below it, uh, and that might help you out in your Fed watching if any of you are in the business of uh, Fed watching to see what it's doing these days. Uh, now, still, it doesn't have much room to maneuver. And some people have suggested that, well, uh, the Fed can do more than just control the federal funds rate or can do more than just control interest rates. It can, can control the money supply directly, just target reserves or target uh, uh, the money supply uh, measured somehow. Uh, let me speak first and very briefly about the possibility of it targeting other rates. Um, this, is, this is a possibility, and this is what the Fed itself has discussed. There was a conference at the Dallas Fed uh, fairly early in uh, 2003 uh, to discuss the, the idea of how to, how to deal in a zero interest economy, you know, what to do. And, uh, and they're talking about the Fed funds rate possibly getting down as low as zero, at which point they conceive of possibly targeting other longer term rates of bidding down the long-term treasury rates, buying long-term treasury bills or treasury bonds or something like that, rather than short-term uh, treasuries. Okay, Still has an effect on the Fed funds rate because when they buy, uh, 
the funds they buy with become federal funds and are lend out a correspondingly uh, lower rate uh, than for the, before the purchase. Plus, it's a little bit risky. It's a dangerous thing. In fact, it could be a part of the meltdown. It's a dangerous thing to be twisting that yield curve, to be pushing down long-term rates uh, down close to where short-term rates are. Because if you think of it, the whole business of commercial banking is borrowing short and lending long. That's, that's how profits are made in the banking industry. And if you've got a Federal Reserve in there pushing long rates down relative to short rates, uh, you pretty much destroy the profitability of commercial banking. And that would be another problem to deal with <laughs> that might be worse than the one that they've got now. Uh, now, beyond meddling with interest rates at all, it's certainly possible for the Fed simply to increase reserves. It, it always has the capacity to increase reserves and thereby increase the money supply uh, and uh, expand that way. Um, but the Fed simply doesn't have the mechanisms in place to do that that it once had. And it also stands to do more damage than harm in, in a very special way. Let me take a look at that now. Uh, so I'll ask the question here, should the Fed return to money growth targeting? That's, that's what the Fed did when Volcker uh, became chairman uh, back in the late 70s. And that's what the Fed did for the first several years of the 1980s, uh, only later to abandon it and to go once again to uh, interest rate uh, targeting. Uh, the first question uh, that I would raise is the question of which which monetary aggregate would they supposedly target? You see, back in the heyday of monetarism, there was an obvious monetary aggregate you could look at. It was called M1. Uh, it was a, a crisp definition of the money supply, if only because of the existence of regulations at the time that prohibited the writing checks on savings account and prohibited the payment of interest on checking accounts you got a virtual black and white distinction between what's money and what's not money. And it gave a crispness, crispness to the definition of the money supply. But Regulation Q was phased out in the early 80s. And the monetary aggregates blend one into the other in a way that uh, gives the Fed no clue of which one it should be looking at. Uh, there's even a wonderful soundbite bite. Uh, from uh, Greenspan testifying at the Joint Economic Committee meeting, uh, a soundbite that's made it onto the Jay Leno show, uh, where Greenspan is asked the question, why don't you just control the money supply? And Greenspan said in almost a forlorn tone, well, we just don't know what money is anymore. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine the fun that Jay Leno had with this? Wouldn't you rather have a chairman who at least knew what money is? <laughs> Would help. But what he meant is that they, they, had lost, they had lost the crisp target because of the phasing out of Regulation Q. Uh, and you can see M1 has, has grown sort of haphazardly and, and uh, in an odd pattern. Uh, but one thing is revealing about uh, the components of this M1. If, if you remember your macro theory. M1 consists of currency and coin. That's, that's one component. It used to be a fairly small component, actually. It used to be uh, between 25 and 30 percent. And the rest of it, the bigger share of M1, is checking account money, the, some of the balances in, in uh, your checking accounts. All right? um, and so we can divide this down in its components. And the interesting component to look at is the currency component. Because, and again, focus on the, the the last 10 years or so of M1, and it looks like it even sags a little and then picks up and so on. But now let's look at the currency component. It's going up and almost in an exponential path, okay, uh, increasing uh, uh, as we go. And it turns out there has been a virtual skyrocketing of uh, M1, or I'm sorry, of the, of the currency component uh, of M1. I've got some uh, statistics on this. Um, so we've had a dramatic rise in the currency ratio. Uh, that's the C currency divided by that uh, basic money supply. 
during the last 10 years, and I went back and just spot checked and looked at the different uh, currency ratios, they stayed in the, in the uh, mid to high 20%. Uh, up until about 93, and after that, uh, they begin uh, rising fairly rapidly. So 1993, uh, just 10 years ago, 28.5%. Uh, 2003, 50.7%. So well over half, well, not well over, but just over half of the money supply reckoned as M1 is in the form of currency. Now, you're suspicious about this. You wonder about this because uh, everything else tells you that uh, people tend to use less currency these days than before. They tend to use plastic and they use debit cards and, and, and so on. They use less currency. And the explanation for this uh, is that uh, most of that currency, in fact, that 50.7% uh, adds up to about, 600, uh, about $650 billion. Okay. And it turns out that... Uh, Estimates vary, but about 320 billion, in other words, just about half of that currency, is currency held abroad. Uh, Leland Yeager, who is with us today, uh, uh, has uh, compiled some interesting statistics uh, on this currency held abroad. Okay, so as much as 320 billion is uh, U.S. dollars held uh, offshore, either in circulation, like in Panama, or in circulation in uh, in Russia or in stashes, like we actually discovered in Iraq and some in Iran and the Middle East uh, generally. Okay, tremendous amounts uh, of, of currency. Uh, something like 90% of all the $100 bills are held outside the United States. Okay, and about 80% of the growth in the currency component over the last several years has been currency that has gone outside the United States, okay? So there's a tremendous amount of currency out there, but offshore, right? Now, this is a worrisome thing to the Federal Reserve because it has no control over how long that stuff stays over there and when it comes back and how fast it comes back. And it'd be very hard to react to it. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been fairly good at reacting to changes in the currency ratio that are minor changes and are caused by such things as the coming of Christmas, okay? The Greenspan can predict every year, it hasn't missed it once, that Christmas is coming and people carry more <laughs> cash and he makes the adjustment. Uh, he predicts vacation times, okay? When people load up their station wagon and drive to California, well, they don't do that so much anymore, but people use currency and vacation times and, and Greenspan can compensate for it. But boy, this is the big one. This is this is a bunch of currency held abroad that could easily come back, uh, and could be could come back in a virtual tidal wave if you stop to think about it. Because people have choices these days; they can hold euros, uh, and uh, instead of uh, U.S. dollars. Professor Yeager points out that there was a blip, pretty significant blip in uh, foreign demand for currency just provoked by our issuing a new $100 bill. It spooked people. They didn't want to hold as much, okay? And uh, possibly a blip with this new 20. I don't know. I mean, the government's spending, what, $33 million trying to advertise the new 20. I hope it's doing plenty of advertising abroad. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Get people to hold, hold this new 20, okay? Uh, but, but one possibly significant uh, factor is that... Uh, a hundred dollar bill is the is the largest bill the U.S. produces, where a euro is produced in, in 500 euro notes. Okay, and so certainly for some uses, say in certain uses where you where where you carry your money in suitcases, uh, <laughs> big suitcases, you don't have to have quite as big a suitcase <laughs> if you have 500 euro notes than if you have $100 bills. So uh, I, I can imagine that this is part of the discussion around that uh, big uh, boardroom table at the Federal Reserve. What happens if uh, people substitute out of U.S. dollars and into euros and all those U.S. dollars come back? See, if those U.S. dollars come back, guess what? They come back essentially as reserves. Okay, if they're deposited in banks, they're reserves, and you get a multiple expansion uh, 
on top of that. So this is something the Fed has to worry about and watch for and brace against. And if it should happen, I'll make two points. One, if it should happen, if it should start happening, uh, it's likely to happen in spades. Okay, It's likely not to be a very stable marginal adjustment out of, out of dollars into euros. It's a kind of a tipping model where once, once the thing starts to tip, it goes. Okay. And people dump uh, dollars and, uh, and use something else instead, euros. Uh, if that happens, all the Fed can do is to try to counteract it. And, of course, to try to counteract it means to, 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 to pull in the money supply, to raise federal funds rate, to contract, right? which is to say to do just the opposite of what the fiscal authority wants them to do, which is lower interest rates and buy U.S. government debt. Right? And in fact, this is the essential reason I say that a meltdown could be the product of a, of a collision course between what the Fed might have to do if that currency comes back and what the Treasury wants the Fed to do, given that it's borrowing at a clip uh, about a million dollars a minute. Okay? Uh, this is certainly something to think about. Right? Uh, I might also note, and I pulled this graph out of uh, a paper written in 2000 by uh, Bradford DeLong. Uh, it's a graph that helps put uh, monetarism of the Friedman uh, brand in uh, sharp relief, sharp perspective. Because if you remember your monetarism, uh, Friedman depended on a very tight statistical correlation between the quantity of money and the price level. And it turns out that that, that statistical fit was fairly robust during the heyday of monetarism. Uh, when, say, in between the 60 and 80, uh, this, this purple line actually here is the pre-1980s trend in the velocity of money. So the average rate that dollars are spent in the economy uh, had an upward trend, but it was very stable, very predictable. And in fact, uh, the, you can see the actual movement in the velocity of money deviated very little from the trend. Okay? Now, it turns out that that all came undone in the early 80s. It was with the uh, phasing out of Regulation Q, I would argue, that started the undoing of that stable velocity, which, which actually I like to refer to as the irony of monetarism, that the, that the monetarist statistics held only to the extent that there was pretty strict regulations imposed on what you can do with a checking account and what you can do with a saving account. You pull the regulations off and uh, you lose the crispness of the money supply uh, and the velocity becomes unstable. It falls well below trend and part of that is because of money going overseas, at least starting in, uh, in the early 90s. Uh, if, we, if we plotted this on out, this is the actual velocity of money. Um, if you plotted it on out, what you'd see is, is this curve peaking out uh, around 9, a little over 9, and falling back now to somewhere around 8.4. So it hasn't picked up a different trend. It hasn't just moved to some other trend. It's still jagged up and down and very unpredictable. And so, see, these are the kind of things that made monetarism work at the time that it did work. You had a, you had a tight definition of money well-defined, and you had a strong relationship between money and the price level because of a stable demand for money, all right? And now you don't have either. You don't have any, any money supply that's uh, easily controlled. Uh, you have worries about currency coming back from abroad, and even if you can control the money supply, you don't have a hard-line uh, uh, relationship between it and the price level because of this uh, erratic and unstable uh, velocity. There's the heyday of monetarism back there. Okay. Now, let's go back to the fiscal side of it and look at saving. Okay. And you can see that uh, this, this is a great graph because it's one that puts Keynes in his place, I think. Uh, here is saving during the Clinton boom. Uh, income was going up. Consumption was going up. Saving was going up. Everything was going up. Okay. That's sort of a Keynes-style uh, process. And of course, it's temporary, and it was uh, uh, bound to turn to a bust. But while it lasted, uh, the statistics looked very Keynesian. But when the bust came, then, of course, income growth slowed down, actually turned negative in just a couple of quarters. And so if you plotted income, it would still be going up, but at a slower pace. But saving is going down even in an absolute sense, and certainly relative to what it was. Okay, so this is a saving trend. Uh, 
which is one of the things that puts the deposit to saving ratio up as high as it is, okay? Because you've got uh, reduced saving, uh, probably hit around uh, 1400 billion by 2004. Uh, so that's, this makes uh, the, the deficit to saving uh, puts it in perspective and shows that, uh, that uh, the Treasury is a big player in uh, credit markets. Uh, look at the likely movements in the deficit to saving ratio. The deficit's likely to go up, saving is likely to go down <laughs> further, project those trends. And you're likely to have even uh, a bigger player on your hands, uh, which causes lots of trouble. In fact, here, now I've summarized for you in a couple of minutes I have remaining, uh, what I like to call the short list of bad options. Put yourself in the position of a fiscal strategist <laughs> for the U.S. government. What can you do and what should you do? Uh, and get, to get the flavor of this, all you have to do is listen to the nine Democratic contenders for the nomination debate. <laughs> <laughs> because each of them has to choose from this short list of bad options and explain what they would do, you see. Uh, so let's look at the options first. You could borrow domestically, okay, start borrowing from people at home, uh, monetize debt, get Alan Greenspan on your side. Borrow abroad, that's what they've been doing uh, largely. Raise taxes, you know how that plays in the, in the polls. Or continue debating, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's the current solution. But uh, and each of these has consequences, none of which are good, okay? Uh, borrow domestically, you're going to get high interest rates, okay? Monetize that, you're going to get inflation, and this time, a leveraged inflation. Because if we start seeing debt monetization in this country and start seeing inflation like we had uh, back in the, in, in the late 70s and early 80s, then I'll guarantee you uh, that those foreign dollars are going to come home. And when they come home, that's going to put a lot of leverage on that inflation. So uh, if I want to make one prediction uh, today, and I'm not, I'm not big on making predictions, but I'll make one. And that is that we won't have just a little bit of inflation, <laughs> okay? <laughs> we won't have just a little bit. If we have it, it'll be a lot. A borrower abroad that's going to give you weak export markets and all the problems that causes. Raise taxes, you're going to get dampened market activity all around. And do nothing but continue debating, you're going to get market uncertainties. That's what we see now. We see the whole investment sector setting back because they don't know what the climate is going to be in the uh, in the coming years, because nobody has uh, been willing to set a course and stick with it, okay? Because they don't want to choose from this short list of bad options. Okay, well, let me leave you with a look at the debt. This is debt, not deficit. This is accumulated debt. And look at the recent upturn. Pretty sharp, all right? Now, how many are optimistic and think that what might happen between now and 2010? If you're optimistic, hey... You know, pay that sucker <laughs> off, be debt free. Do I have any takers? Okay. <laughs> Who's pessimistic? Okay, if it's going that way, we're in trouble in any number of ways. Thank you.